Imagine, for a moment, a world not so different from our own, yet profoundly alien. A Europe sculpted by the relentless advance and retreat of ice, a raw and untamed wilderness where megafauna roamed free, and the very air hummed with the struggle for survival. This is our planet, some 50,000 years ago. A time when two distinct branches of humanity, both intelligent, both resourceful, walked the earth. For hundreds of thousands of years, one of these groups, the Neanderthals, had made Europe their home. They were the original Europeans, perfectly adapted to its often harsh climates. Think of them as the true natives of this icy continent, honed by generations to thrive where others might perish. Their very physique spoke of their world. Robust, muscular bodies, broad noses designed to warm the frigid air, and powerful limbs built for close quarters, hunting and navigating rugged terrain. They were, in essence, a living testament to resilience. Their lives revolved around the primal rhythms of the land. They were master hunters, not with the finesse of long-range weaponry, but with sheer strength and courage. Picture a group of them tracking a woolly mammoth across the frozen tundra. This wasn't a casual pursuit. It was a life-or-death confrontation. Armed with heavy, thrusting spears, often nothing more than sharpened wooden shafts with stone tips, they'd face these colossal beasts head-on, a testament to their bravery and their absolute reliance on meat for sustenance. Every hunt was a calculated risk, a brutal dance between predator and prey that underscored their deep connection to the animals that fed them. Their tools, the Mousterian toolkit, were pragmatic and effective. Flakes struck from a core, sharpened into versatile scrapers for preparing hides or sturdy spear points for the kill. They were not ornate, but they were efficient, perfectly suited to the demands of their environment. Every tool was a testament to their ingenuity, crafted for immediate, practical use in a world that offered no quarter. But beyond the stereotype of the brutish caveman, a more nuanced picture emerges from the archaeological record. Neanderthals lived in small, tightly knit family groups, bound by necessity and loyalty. Evidence from sites like Shanadar Cave in Iraq suggests a deep capacity for compassion. Imagine an elderly, injured Neanderthal unable to hunt, cared for by his family for years. Bones show healed fractures, signs of long-term disability, yet he survived. This wasn't merely survival of the fittest. It was survival through community, through empathy. They buried their dead, sometimes with offerings, hinting at a nascent understanding of the spiritual, or at least a profound respect for their lost loved ones. And within these groups, the Neanderthal women played an indispensable role. They weren't passive figures, far from it. Their robust physiques meant they were likely just as involved in the strenuous daily tasks as the men. While the men might lead the dangerous hunts, the women were undoubtedly crucial to the success of the clan. They processed the kills, transforming raw hides into warm clothing and shelters, using stone scrapers to painstakingly remove flesh and hair. They gathered plant foods, a vital supplement in times when large game was scarce and maintained the precious fires that offered warmth, light, and protection from predators. Child-rearing in such a harsh world was a collective effort, but the burden would have fallen heavily on them. Their strength, resilience, and intimate knowledge of their surroundings were fundamental to the survival of their people. But as the millennia turned, another group of humans began to spread across the globe. Our direct ancestors, early modern humans, often referred to as Cro-Magnons in Europe. They had emerged from Africa, adapting and evolving, now embarking on a grand migration that would eventually lead them to the very doorstep of the Neanderthals' ancient homeland. Physically, they were built differently from their Neanderthal cousins, taller, more slender, with flatter faces and prominent chins. But don't mistake this for fragility. They were equally tough, equally clever, 
but their adaptations leaned towards different strategies. Where the Neanderthals relied on raw power, early modern humans often favored ingenuity and innovation. Their toolkit was a revolution. The upper Paleolithic toolkit featured blades struck from cores, long and sharp, used to create a vast array of specialized implements. Bone, antler, and ivory were transformed into needles for sewing sophisticated clothing, fish hooks, spear throwers, the atlatl, which dramatically increased the range and power of their projectile weapons, making hunting safer and more efficient. They hunted a wider variety of animals, not just the megafauna, but also fish and birds, demonstrating a greater adaptability to diverse food sources. But perhaps the most striking difference lay in their minds. Early modern humans displayed an explosion of symbolic thought and artistic expression. The walls of caves, like Lascaux and Chauvet in France, became their canvases, adorned with breathtaking depictions of animals, hunting scenes, and abstract symbols. They crafted intricate personal ornaments, beads, pendants, and carved figurines like the iconic Venus statuettes. This wasn't merely practical. It was an expression of inner worlds, complex social structures, and perhaps a deeper connection to the spiritual realm. Their social networks were larger, more complex, allowing for the sharing of ideas, technologies, and even mates over vast distances. And like their Neanderthal counterparts, the women among early modern humans were central to their societies. With advanced tools, they could craft more efficient clothing, build more structured shelters, and potentially manage food resources with greater sophistication. While men might bring down the lodge game, women gathered the vast majority of calories, managed domestic life, and passed down crucial knowledge. The development of art and symbolism could also be seen as a collective effort, with women likely playing a significant role in its creation and transmission, weaving the very fabric of their burgeoning culture. So, picture the scene. Two distinct human stories unfolding on the same continent, drawing ever closer. For thousands of years, they were separate, perhaps only vaguely aware of each other's existence. But the Earth's climate was in flux. Ice sheets advanced and retreated, forcing populations to move, to seek new hunting grounds, new shelters. And inevitably, their paths began to cross. These encounters wouldn't have been like modern warfare with armies clashing. Instead, imagine something far more subtle, yet profoundly significant. A small Neanderthal hunting party, wary and alert, stumbling upon the camp of a group of early modern humans. Or a modern human family, exploring new territory, finding the faint traces of a Neanderthal presence, a discarded tool, the remains of an ancient campfire. There would have been a language barrier, certainly, different vocalizations, different customs, but these were both highly intelligent social species. Communication would have been attempted, perhaps through gestures, shared glances, or the universal language of need. Did they trade? Did they share knowledge of the land, of animal movements? Or was it always a tense standoff, an uneasy coexistence? The archaeological record offers tantalizing clues, but the full story remains veiled in time. But we do know one thing for certain, something that fundamentally reshaped our understanding of human history. These encounters were not always purely competitive. They were, at times, intimate. For somewhere, in the vast wilderness of Europe or the Middle East, Neanderthal women met modern human ancestors, and they interbred. This isn't speculation. It's written in our very DNA. If your ancestry traces back to outside of Africa, and that's most of humanity, then you carry a small yet significant percentage of Neanderthal DNA. It's typically between 1 and 4 percent. A whisper of a long-lost past echoing in every cell of our bodies. The question then becomes, how did this gene flow occur? And specifically, what was the role of Neanderthal women in these pivotal moments? For a long time, scientists debated the direction of this interbreeding, 
Was it primarily Neanderthal men mating with modern human women or the other way around? The evidence is complex, but some studies suggest a fascinating possibility that the gene flow might have been predominantly from Neanderthal men into modern human populations, or perhaps, crucially, that Neanderthal women may have been more readily integrated into modern human groups. Consider the context. Neanderthal groups were often small, geographically isolated. They faced constant challenges, the brutal climate, the dangerous hunts, the struggle to find enough food. For a small clan, finding mates outside their immediate family could have been a desperate necessity, a matter of survival. An encounter with a larger, perhaps more mobile and technologically diverse group of modern humans could have presented an unexpected opportunity. It's a compelling idea. Perhaps a Neanderthal woman, her clan depleted by hardship, found herself in contact with a modern human group. Was she captured? Did she choose to go with them, seeking better prospects, safety, or new companionship? Or perhaps, in a moment of shared humanity, attraction blossomed across the species divide? We will likely never know the precise details of these individual encounters, but the genetic legacy is undeniable. These were not just scientific facts. They were human stories, played out in the harsh wilderness of an ancient world. The implications are profound. It suggests that despite their physical and cultural differences, there was enough common ground, enough shared humanity for offspring to be produced and, crucially, for those hybrid children to survive and reproduce within modern human communities. It challenges the simplistic notion of distinct, unchanging species locked in an inevitable struggle for dominance. Instead, it paints a picture of a more fluid, interconnected past. What happened next, however, is a story of gradual change and ultimate disappearance for one of these human groups. The modern human populations continued to grow, their numbers increasing, their technologies advancing. They were perhaps more adaptable to fluctuating climates, their broader diet and more efficient hunting methods giving them an edge. They spread across the continent, slowly, steadily, outnumbering their Neanderthal cousins. This wasn't a sudden, cataclysmic event. There's no evidence of widespread violence or an outright war of extermination. It was far more subtle, more insidious. The theories for the Neanderthals' eventual disappearance are many, and it was likely a combination of factors. Climate change played a part. The late Pleistocene was a period of intense and rapid climatic shifts, and the Neanderthals, highly specialized for their environment, may have struggled to adapt. Competition for resources with the burgeoning modern human populations would have put immense pressure on their smaller, more isolated groups. Perhaps they were outcompeted in the long run, their unique hunting strategies less sustainable as environments changed, whilst modern humans, with their projectile weapons and more diverse diets, could secure resources more efficiently. Some theories even suggest that new diseases, brought by the migrating modern humans, might have contributed to their decline. And of course, there's the possibility of assimilation. A gradual absorption into the larger, more robust modern human populations a slow fading of their distinct identity as their numbers dwindled. The interbreeding we see in our DNA is certainly a part of that story. The last known Neanderthals lived in pockets of southern Europe, places like Gibraltar, until roughly 30,000 years ago. After that, silence. Their footprints vanished from the earth, their voices silenced by the relentless march of time, yet their legacy endures. Every time we look at our own hands, at the shape of our bones, at the very blueprint of our cells, we are reminded of their existence. That small percentage of Neanderthal DNA in many of us is a profound connection to a lost branch of humanity. It influences aspects of our skin, our hair, our immune systems, even our susceptibility to certain diseases. It's a testament to the fact that our family tree is far more complex, far more interwoven than we once imagined. We've moved beyond the caricature of the primitive caveman. 
Today, we understand Neanderthals as intelligent, adaptable, and deeply human in their own way. They crafted tools, cared for their sick, buried their dead, and survived for hundreds of thousands of years in incredibly challenging environments. They were not a failure of evolution, but a testament to a different path, a different solution to the challenges of survival. The story of the Neanderthal woman who met a modern human ancestor is not just a tale of ancient encounters. It's a powerful reminder of our shared past, of the fluidity of life, and of the incredible journey of humanity. It tells us that what defines us as human is not a single, linear path, but a rich tapestry woven from countless threads, including those of our ancient cousins. Fifty millennia later, the echoes of their lives and their profound interactions still resonate. What can the extraordinary story of the Neanderthals and their intimate encounters with our ancestors teach us about ourselves, about diversity, and about our remarkable shared lineage even today? Perhaps it's that humanity in all its forms is capable of enduring, adapting, and ultimately interweaving. A powerful lesson from a long-lost world.